The victims of this rather horrendous, notorious and historical crime are Joe Moore, his wife Sarah Moore, sleeping in the room next to theirs and also victims of this crime were their children. There was little Herman who was 11 years of age. He was about to turn 12 but still 11 at the time. In a bed next to him was his sister Mary Catherine. She was going to have a birthday the following week. She would have been 10 on her next birthday. And over in the other corner were their little brothers. Arthur Boyd Moore, who was seven years old at the time, and he shared the bed, he shared his bed with his baby brother, Paul. Little Paul was five years old at the time that he was taken. Now downstairs in the sewing room slash guest room were little Ina Mae Stillinger and her big sister, Lena. Ina was nine years of age and Lena was 11 going on 12, closer to 12. Unfortunately, the little girls made the choice to stay the night at the Moors rather than walk home to their grandmothers after the church celebration. Now on the day that the murders took place, that day was a normal day, it was Sunday, church service day. Joe got up, fed the pigs, looked after the cow, looked after the horses, fed the chickens. The children were seen by neighbors outside playing in the front yard. And Sarah was doing what she would normally do that morning, washing, cooking, and getting the kids ready for church for the 11 o'clock service. 11 o'clock came along and they went down to their normal church service. They saw Lena and Ina there at the church service who did ask later that night after the big church celebration, could they please stay the night rather than walk home to their grandmothers? Joe said yes and he would check with their sister Blanche. In the afternoon about 4.30, the Moore family went to Joe's mum and dad's and had supper. When they got home, Joe did ring Blanche and ask, can the girls stay the night after the celebration? Of course, said Blanche, not a problem. Of course they can. So the family went down to the church that evening for the celebrations, which took place. All the kids, you know, did some readings. There was a little play put on. Um, the kids had been practicing and that day indeed had also practiced with Sarah in the afternoon. She stayed back after the church service to do that. So they walked home and with them came Ina and Lena. They went inside, did whatever it is they do before they go to bed and they all went to bed. People around town on the 9th and indeed the day of the 10th had had little talks about things that they had seen leading up to the murder and the night of the murder. A lot of people stated that they had seen some strangers in town. Some said they saw a salesman that was not familiar to them. Others said they saw a funny little man coming out of the forest near the railway tracks. Some attested to a group of two to three men huddled in the dark shadows discussing things. Uh, some even said that they saw a hobo alight from a train and of course others discussed the possibility that one of the axe murderers that had been notoriously killing families over the years had arrived on their doorstep. In 1912, 11, even after these murders and in the late 1800s, there were a lot of murders that were done with an axe and indeed families were taken out. Uh, so. Unfortunately, it was not an uncommon thing to see in that time period. A lot of times it turned out to be a family member that had committed the crime. Uh, in a lot of circumstances, they couldn't find anybody, they didn't know and hence they thought there was just some madman on the loose. Now, back to the story of people who say they saw some strange people in the neighborhood. There was Mrs. Glackmire who happened to be looking out of her window and saw a funny little man walking up and down the street, seemingly looking at houses. She was a bit 
wondering what it was he wanted or was he lost and she said to her husband go out and see what that man's doing would you by the time her husband got off the couch as he was reading his paper and made his way out the front door the funny little man couldn't be found and then we have young albert himmler now albert had been at the church service that uh the celebration he took his girlfriend for a little ride on his buggy uh, after the service and dropped her off at home around about 11, 11.30. And he said that on his way back to take his horses and put them in the stable, uh, his horse got a little bit frightened by something and he noted that there was uh, two or three men uh, standing on a street corner near to the Moor home in deep discussion. He, uh, he said their backs were to him. He shone his lantern on their back and, and sort of thought nothing of it really and, and then just went on his way. The next person to talk about what they had seen the weekend and the evening of, of the murder was a lady called Alice Willard. Now, Alice was a divorced lady. She lived with her father, Mr. Holland, and they lived about a block south of Joe Moore's house. On the Saturday morning, so the day before, the murders took place. She said she saw two strangers walking past the Moore house. They turned the corner and came by her house. She said they frightened her a little bit, so she took note of them. They were strangers, she hadn't seen them before, and so she took careful note of, of what they looked like. Later that night, she went out for a car drive with a, a salesman called Ed McRae. The car broke down and they had to walk back to her house. So on the way, they saw some men approaching um, them from the south so they decided to hide themselves because they in that day and age for her to be seen with this gentleman wouldn't have been appropriate so they sort of hid out the way to wait for these people to go by but she said as they got closer she recognized two of the men as the men that she'd seen uh, the Saturday morning and she also recognized uh, Frank Jones and the local pool hall operator Bert McCall she said that the five men were just in front of them um, and she could, couldn't could quite hear what they were planning, but she did hear the phrase, get Joe first and the rest will be easy. Now, another lady to uh, talk about what she had seen or overheard at the time of the murders was a lady called Vina Tompkins. Her husband and herself had been camping just outside of uh, Villisca because her husband was working on some brick paving uh, for the city's main street. She said that she overheard three men talking about money behind the old slaughterhouse just southwest of Villisca. She thought one of the men resembled Frank Jones, but she could not swear it was him. Now to say they were discussing money in regard to doing away with somebody is a stretch, but that was her that was her evidence that he was talking to two other men about money. Now, another man to uh, talk about what he had seen the night of the murders was Ed Landers. Now, Ed was an insurance salesman. He had been staying with his mother just across the street, uh, up one block from the Moore's home. He said that uh, on the night in question, he and his wife were walking along the street at about quarter past 8, 8.15 on the Sunday night. He said a man was just a few steps ahead of them and uh, turned and walked right in Joe's house. Ed identified the man as Albert Jones. He said that at the time he didn't know it was Albert in front of him until he turned to walk into the Moore's home. The funny thing is, however, with his evidence is that at the time of the inquest, when the murders happened, he said he hadn't noticed anything odd at all. So either way, that was his evidence. And I just wanted to touch on one thing. It was said that um, there's actually a book written about it called The Man from the Train. There was a theory that the killer was a train hopping serial killer. Uh, looking over the book and looking over interviews with um, different people, I've come to the conclusion that although it's a good book, although it touches on a lot of things, the authors only used the newspapers to research this story. They didn't use anything else. Uh, they weren't able to get police records. They didn't see anything in regard to the crimes. And 
there was no obvious links that made the crimes the same. The MO was different on a lot of occasions. Uh, and the other thing was that this man was a German immigrant. He lived on a farm where a family was murdered and he disappeared that night on a train um, after they were murdered. And one thing to think about is the fact that back in the day, it was very often fingers pointed at the immigrants for anything like this happening. If you were an immigrant, you were the first person pulled up and questioned over any death. So my theory on this is that it probably wasn't him. He probably didn't kill anyone else. It's all a theory. There is no proof he killed other people. Um, so there's reasons why he would have run. Uh, why he would kill them is he was apparently by all accounts working quite well for the family. There's, there's nothing that really links him proof-wise. If they could prove that, if they could get uh, police records, if they could in some way even say that how they believe he was in Villisca the night the murders happened, there's nothing linking him. There's nothing actually technically linking to him to a lot of these murders. It's just that they were all axe murders. They were all murders of opportunity. And for whatever reason, they're picking on uh, Mueller. Anyway, that's my opinion. I don't think it was him. But let's get on with the story. Okay, so we come to Monday morning. It's early hours of the morning. Um, and it was about 7.30 in the morning. Mrs Peckham, the next door neighbour, had been up for a while doing her washing. And she noted that for the longest time she hadn't seen anybody, no movement in the house, which was unusual. By this time, Joe was up feeding the animals, the children were usually running around. There was a lot of stuff going on. She also noted no one had been out to use the bathroom, the toilet, the privy, whatever you would like to call it. So she took herself across to the house and she knocked on the door. She thought she should check it out, knocked on the door. The animals were still all tied up and everything. So, so she couldn't get any answer by knocking on the door. She couldn't see through the windows. So she went home, used her telephone and called Ross Moore, Joe's uh, brother. Ross said he'd come on over uh, and she also called uh, Joe's store and spoke with Ed Sally. Ed, Ed Sally worked for Joe. Uh, Ed said, all right, I'll, I'll come on down. He's, he's not here yet. I'll come on down. So Ed came down to the house. He looked after the animals, untied the horse, you know, the cow, etc. did all the chores waiting for Ross to arrive. Ross arrives, uh, they go to the house, Mary's with him, uh, and Ross lets himself in, he's got a key. Uh, he lets himself in, he apparently walks to the parlor first, which I thought was kind of strange, like why not walk in, shout out, look in the kitchen, and then go upstairs where you know they sleep. Uh, but anyway, he didn't, he walked across to the parlor, and through to the sewing room slash guest room and that's where he saw two figures in the bed um, he didn't bother walking in he just knew something looked wrong uh, and there was blood so he went back outside onto the porch and said to Mrs Peckham please go and call for the marshal uh, and so uh, she did now while she was calling for the marshal Ed took off he went in back into town and he found Marshal Horton and he said come on, you've, you've got to come quick. Something terrible's happened at the Moore home. So Horton came to the house. By this time, it was yeah about 8.30, maybe quarter to nine. Horton came in and he said to Ross, what, what's happened? Ross just said something horrible. Uh, so Horton and Ed went into the house. Uh, Horton went straight to the room that Ross told him about and it was dark inside. Uh, due to the, the curtains and everything being closed. So apparently he lit a match so he could see. He opened the curtains in that room so he could get some light in and he pulled back the covers on the bed. And he saw the little girl, he saw obviously Ina, and uh, he saw what he thought was a, a young woman, but it was Lena. Uh, Lena was in a, in a, although covered with the sheets, when he pulled the sheets back, Lena was in a position that would only later be called possibly a sexual pose um, uh, so anyway he, he walked out of the room Ed had seen that as well obviously uh, and he said well come on Ed we better keep looking Ed said no thank you uh, I, I will just uh, go outside and wait 
Now, the other thing noted in that room was that's where the axe was found. So the axe was leaning up against the wall. On the floor next to the axe was a four pound piece of bacon wrapped up in some cloth and string. And uh, there was also a lamp that was at the foot of the bed. But for whatever reason, the little chimney on the lamp had been taken off and that was under the dresser. And the dresser mirror was covered with a, a big skirt. So anyway, Horton went up the stairs. He went up alone. Uh, and remember too, he, he, he wasn't a trained policeman. He was a marshal. He was someone the town trusted. He'd been a farmer before and he basically got the job. The most he ever had to do was really lock up a drunk or, or check on some, you know, some small matter. So here you've got a man with no training walking up the stairs. The stairway led directly into the Moors bedroom. So you came up the top of the stairs and anyone who's been to the house uh, will know this. You come straight up the top of the steps and you basically walk straight into the main bedroom. So when he got up there, that's where he found Joe and Sarah. He, he obviously, he could see they'd, they'd been mutilated. Joe's skull was completely crushed. Uh, and Sarah was struck uh, what seemed to be on top of the head and across the face. Their faces were covered with washcloths and, and the sheets uh, as well. Horton also found the children. Um, little Herman was uh, on his cot, or you know, a small bed, uh, on the east wall. Uh, then there was Mary, uh, C Mary Catherine was in the, um, the southeast corner of that room, so her bed was in the corner, and the other little boys were on the north west wall uh, and they slept together so he's found those boy the children as well um, toys were in the middle of the room uh, there was an axe mark on the roof as well and there was also an axe mark uh, above the bed in joe and sarah's room and again the kitties faces were covered with cloths so horton left and uh, he had to go back into town and call various people to come and help obviously and he left a young boy in charge um, the young constable in charge and unfortunately while he was gone all the townspeople gathered and before any forensics well not that they called it that back in the day but before anything could be looked at evidence wise etc um, there were people walking in and out looking at the bodies someone even took a piece of, of Joe's skull so not good the other thing of note throughout the crime scene were the covering of the mirrors and uh, the covering of the faces with the cloth and the bed sheets. I'll touch on that a little bit later. Also, there was a story about someone hiding in the cupboard in the closet and waiting for the family to get home. That story actually uh, originated from Minnie Moore. Minnie was Joe's uh, sister and she was talking to a reporter a few days after and suggested, is it possible that the, uh, the killer was waiting for them in a closet until they got home. So this reporter obviously went back to the house and um, took part in a little mischief got uh, and said that there was cigarette butts found in the closet along with a footprint and a box uh, that had been crushed by someone possibly sitting on it uh, lying in wait um, so the story behind that is that it was probably an opportunity for the journalist to get a headline a little bit of sensationalism because the people that investigated the house uh, the doctors and the coroner uh, all said that once they went through the house that there was no such footprint there was nothing in the closet and indeed it had been noted that the box uh, in the cupboard was intact and in good condition so that um, story about the person laying in wait is actually one that you can dismiss despite the fact that a lot of people like to concentrate on that with their investigations. Um, that was a false narrative put out by a reporter wanting a headline. Okay, now to the suspects, at least a few of them, because there were many. In this instance, Henry Lee Moore was considered 
uh, because a few months after the Beliska killings, he murdered his uh, grandma and his mother. And he did that uh, because he wanted the um, land that they owned. So that was with the motive, pure greed. Uh, they didn't have any really great evidence against him to tie him to the Villisca murders, so the idea that he did it was basically thrown out the window. Okay, Reverend Kelly. Now, I haven't got hours and hours to talk to you about Reverend Kelly, so I'll break it down. But he is one of the main choices. Uh, some people say that he indeed was the killer. There's varying opinions on that one. Reverend Kelly was an Englishman. Most importantly, he was very little, a little man, and he was only five foot two inches. He was in Villisca the day of the murders, and he was staying with Reverend Ewing. He attended the church where the family attended church. He went that day and, and he indeed watched the um, Sunday school celebrations. He went back with Reverend uh, Ewing to Reverend Ewing's house. They sat for quite some time until around about 11.30, 11, 11.30 at night when Reverend Ewing went out to bed. He was sleeping outside with his family in a tent because he had some breathing issues. So Reverend Kelly basically had the house to himself. He had a room with a balcony. Uh, he said he did stand out on the balcony at one point through the night and thought that he heard some commotion or noise. He had to leave early in the morning and catch a train to get to the next township. So Reverend Ewing had set a, a alarm clock for him. And uh, so far as Reverend Ewing was concerned, that was the end of that. And now the other interesting thing about Reverend George Jacqueline Kelly was that uh, in 1914, so well after the, the murders, uh, he was charged with sending obscene writings via mail. Uh, what had happened was he put this advertisement in the paper. A young lady replied to it uh, and he wrote back to her and said, there's only one thing, of course, that if you do this, if you take the job, there's a stipulation you do have to type in the nude. Well, the young lady was quite offended by this. She took it to her local minister. The minister took it to the police and the police took it to the uh, US mail service. Somebody decided to converse with Reverend Kelly via mail, seeing how far he would go with this uh, conversation via mail. Eventually it got a little bit too raunchy and they turned up on his doorstep, arrested him and he indeed um, went to jail but they didn't put him in jail they sent him to a mental institution because they did say that he wasn't very well and that is one of the reasons um, that he was considered for the murders because he had this sexual deviation type of issue he was definitely mentally unwell uh, so they they talked to a few people they gathered what they thought was a bit of evidence in 1917 he he was charged with the uh, funnily enough only the murder of Lena downstairs um, they based that I believe on the fact of how she was found it was a hung jury the first time and the second time he was acquitted he did confess however the way the confession was uh, obtained was questionable there's no evidence that he was beaten by the policeman. However, uh, he was questioned by three policemen who were quite big and burly and yelled at him a lot. Uh, he did present with a black eye at the sentencing. And the other thing the police did was when they had questioned him for hours and hours and hours and were dealing with a man with a very um, bad mental condition, they sent him back to his uh, cell and in the cell he had two cellmates. Uh, both of them were very naughty criminals apparently but as it turned out they were not criminals. One was a journalist and the other one was a um, investigator. So what they basically did was tell Kelly that he should confess because if he doesn't confess he'll still be found guilty and it will be bad for him. So he might as well tell them that he did it. So. Kelly did. He confessed to the crime. He said that he couldn't sleep. He saw the girls getting ready for bed uh, and he went in and, and did away with the family. 
that confession was thrown out in court. He was acquitted of the crime and reason being that they believed that due to his ill mental health, the fact that he was questioned the way he was and tricked, that the confession was not real. It was just something that he said in order not to uh, get into any more trouble than he was already in. Also, uh, just to note, uh, a little tidbit of interest, the actual family of the murder victims, so Lena and Ina's dad and uh, Sarah's dad, uh, believed that Kelly was innocent and indeed really did rally for him and they believed that someone else was responsible for the killings and that's who we'll talk about next. Frank F. Jones, an Iowa State Senator, banker, businessman, Sunday school superintendent, um, married man, had children and uh, grown children now, Joe Moore used to work for Frank at the hardware store, but what happened was John Deere approached Joe Moore and said, hey, Joe, we're going to offer you a dealership if you open up your own store. How do you feel about that? So Joe thought, well, that sounds like a really good idea. I'll be my own boss. Thank you very much. I'll take you up on the offer. Now, obviously, Frank was really angry about this because uh, he had the John Deere dealership and it was taken from him when John Deere gave it to Joe. So there was quite some animosity between the two and the other thing that was happening at the time was that uh, Frank's son was married to a lady called Dona uh, and she was quite the little miss around town apparently she flirted and whatnot with quite a few married men in town when her husband was not at home and Joe was one of them. And the reason they knew that Joe was one of them was because he would often call her on the phone to ask if, you know, can we meet up? And of course, back in those days, the um, switchboard operators, when they put you through, which is what they did, they'd connect you to the line, could still hear what you were saying. So uh, they would overhear the, the chatter and they knew that Joe and Donna were having an affair. Now, those reasons were used as a motive uh, as to why Frank would hire somebody to knock Joe off and the family. Uh, it was said that he uh, hired men to do it and indeed one of the men that were accused of being hired by uh, Frank was uh, this fellow, William Mansfield. Now, William, he, he was a married man, but he'd left his wife and he'd taken up with another young lady. Um, at some point, his uh, first wife, who was pregnant at the time he left her, apparently he didn't know she was pregnant, but he left her. She had a baby and she was uh, living with uh, her parents and they were murdered, uh, acts murdered. Uh, and they did try to pin it on uh, William Mansfield, but well, they just couldn't get any evidence because he honestly wasn't in town when it happened. So, so that murder went unsolved, but um, yeah, so they couldn't indict him for, for that murder. But apparently he had a bit of uh, reputation and you know, they say that somehow uh, he was recommended to Frank as somebody who could uh, do the job. So a couple of things I thought I'd uh, put forward in closing are a few little strange things you may not be aware of. Uh, so I'll explain a few things. Number one, though, I did look into what the moon was doing that night. I was interested to see, you know, was it a full moon? How bright was the moon? Could the killer have seen by the light of the moon? Um, it's possible, however, unlikely, because the moon was actually on that evening what is known as a waning crescent moon. So although there was some light from it, probably not enough to see inside a dark house over night time. Uh, the other thing is mirrors and the covering of the faces with washcloths. So a lot of different things would be done after a person passed away in the house. First thing would be to stop all the clocks. 
they were all stopped at the time of death. Mirrors in the house were either draped with a black cloth or would be turned to the wall so that the spirit of the deceased could not get caught in them. And also, uh, mirrors were covered because it was thought that looking into a mirror could lead to death. Apparently, if you look into the mirror at midnight when someone's passed away in the house, you can die. If you look into the mirror at all after someone has passed away in the house, within a year you will be dead. So it was very much a superstitious um, reason for covering the mirrors. The covering of the faces was a belief that the soul could escape through the mouth, so they would cover the face so that couldn't happen. They also say that the killer used a lantern to get around and at the same time he wielded the axe to commit the crime. My problem with that is that the axe weighs five pounds, five to six pounds. It's had a really large handle, quite heavy. So either a hugely large man with very strong arms did that and carried the lantern at the same time. Possible that he put the lantern down before he did it, or more possible is the fact that it was more than one killer. The other reason I think it was more than one person is that uh, the curtains, the, the drapes, the, the blinds in the house were all pulled down. Um, I don't understand how that could have been done before killing the uh, occupants of the home because surely doing that would have woken someone. They took a risk doing that before they killed the Moors. It is possible that if there were two or more people, then they did it sort of all in tandem. That's a possibility. The other thing to mention is the bacon. A forensic expert was sent for to uh, the day after the murders. Uh, McGroffy was his name, I believe. He came from Leavenworth uh, Prison and he had a look around the place. Um, he had his own assumptions about how the, the murders uh, were done. And he also suggested that the bacon was used in a manner that's a bit gross, uh, in a sexual way. However, my theory on that is very simple. The bacon was wrapped in cloth with a string and uh, I would dare say that given the original cut of bacon was placed back in the pantry, probably Joe, before everybody went to sleep that night, cut off a piece of bacon for the young girls to take home to their family. He did have pigs after all and probably slaughtered them himself and I think that that was all that was. I think the girls just happened to have that in their room. They were going to leave early in the morning because the school teacher was going to come by and pick them up. The other thing that's talked about often is crime scene photos. Where are they? Well, they don't exist. Only one survived. Uh, but what happened was uh, that the brother, uh, Ross Moore, confronted the uh, for photographer when he came out of the home. He'd been in there taking photographs of the crime scene. And when he came out and Ross saw the camera, he had a hissy fit. They had a fight. The camera was broken and the film exposed. Uh, I don't know why they didn't go back in to take more, possibly just because the camera was broken, maybe they couldn't. Which brings me to my last point, and then I'll leave it for you to ponder. Joe Moore did have a life insurance policy. It was worth $6,000. I wonder who the benefactor was. Uh, obviously, if he passed away, it would have gone to his wife. If, if both of them passed at the same time then it would have been put in in trust I would assume for the children uh, so I wonder obviously if they're all dead who would have got the money I don't think that question's ever been asked and I would love to know who did get the money but anyway that's what I found out that's what I'll leave you to ponder so should you ever get to go to the house uh, to look at it or to investigate it just remember that the claim of someone hiding in the cupboard was a false claim fake news anyway i hope you enjoyed this episode and let's just think of the victims now and hopefully they are resting in peace and not haunting the house in Villisca. thanks for watching Ooh.